This is a story of the telephone, of its growth and of its people, told in the careers of Jim Larson, who is the hope of tomorrow, of Helen Larson, who is the spirit of today, of Paul Kendall, who is the fulfillment of yesterday. Fifty years, so long and yet so short a time, and often at the end, it seems the beginning was only yesterday. here you're hiring men for telephone work? Men we are hiring, not boys. I learn fast and I'm strong for my years. Oh, how you know? And your name? Kendall. Paul Kendall? Well, how do you do, Mr. Kendall? Mike Cassidy. How do you do? Yes, now, all right, son, now run along. I'm busy, busy. I wasn't sure I wanted the job anyway. You, you what? Oh, I got an uncle who owns the biggest blacksmith shop in town. He thinks I'm crazy not to take a job with him. He says there'll always be blacksmiths, but the telephone, that's just for rich men and gabby women. Nothing but a gadget. Oh, he says that, does he? Well, you listen to me, Mr. Kendall. You've got an uncle who's a fool, and you can quote me. You're talking to a man who helps install one of the very first switchboards there ever was back in New Haven in 78, who helped string the first line between cities, from Boston to Providence. A man who's seen what this telephone has done for the country already in 25 years. A gadget, is it? Well, that's what he said. Well, you tell that weasel-witted uncle of yours that there's already a million telephones in this country, and I'll wager anything he wants to name that there'll be 10 times that many before I die. Anyway, before you die, you tell him that. I'll tell him. Yes. You Oh, 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 don't mind me, son. Just said I'm not an altogether mild man when I get riled. I... Will you, you come on in here with me? I, I want to show you something. You, you had a doubt put in your mind about the future of the telephone business. Here, here's a man in Charleston, South Carolina, say, who wants to buy. And here's a man in San Francisco, California, who wants to sell. Think what it'll be. The Charleston fellow will pick up the telephone and say, Hello, give me San Francisco. San Francisco? Uh, uh, never mind. <laughs> well, any, anyway, you get the idea. And once those research fellas find the right repeaters, you'll be able to hear not just to Chicago like now, but to Omaha, or Denver, or Seattle, or wherever we can plant a pole or string a wire. And that, the both of us will live to see. I'm beginning to believe you're right, Mr. Cassidy. Ha! You can stake your life on it that I am, my boy. Here, look. Keep your eye on that bell, son, and mark my words. But as this nation grows, the telephone will grow with it. And it'll play a strong part in that growing. And the future that lies ahead is beyond the belief of any man. Well, so long, Mr. Cassidy. Now I'm sorry I won't do for that job. Like I said, I learned fast. Get out there with the others. Get to work. Yes, sir. And thus began Paul Kendall's career as a lineman's helper. But he soon found himself concerned with other things. Is your royal whistling highness aware that it's seven minutes past the lunch hour? I'm sorry, Mike. I was busy studying and I didn't realize. What do you got there? Here, let, let me see it. 
principles of electric... Well, how long has this been going on? Over six months now. I've been going to school nights, taking a course in electricity. Oh, you have, have you? What, what's this? The report card. Well, I suppose you know what this means, Mr. Kendall. What? It means you're fired for this gang. Providing, that is, I can get you a, a job in the office where you belong. In the engineer's office at headquarters. Now, close that mouth of yours and get to work. We've got wire to run. The years moved slowly there in the beginning of the century, but already there were signs of things to come. And with the years, the network of telephone communications throughout America was beginning to grow. The long hoped for line from coast to coast was finally nearing reality. Oh, Paul, thanks for coming in. Hello, Mr. Barker. What do you think about that? It's a model of one of the new repeater units, isn't it? The one the lab fellows have been working on? Right, and it's worked out, Paul. Which means that the transcontinental line is no longer something we just talk about. Which brings me to why I sent for you. Seems that they need a few more engineers out there to help on the transcontinental project. Yes, sir. And? And it seems that one of the engineers in charge got hold of the name of a certain young man in this area. It was suggested to him by one of his construction bosses. Mike Cassidy. <laughs> How about it, Paul? Would you like to go? Would I? If it's all right with you, I'll leave yesterday. Well, I think we can compromise on the end of the week. Good luck, Paul, and to tell you the truth, I envy you. Oh. Yes, the plan to bridge the continent by wire had been long in the making. But at last, on June 17th, 1914, There it is, two-way bridge across the mile. Uh, you were a prophet, sure enough, Mike. And it's still only the beginning, Paul. Mark my words, nothing in this world can stop us now. War in Europe. But within three short years, Europe's war was Europe's alone no longer. And all over the nation, thousands of Paul Kendalls join their fellow Americans in the first worldwide struggle against the forces of tyranny. of anxiety as the tide of conflict turned slowly at first and then more swiftly until at last a million and more men could come home to the job of building a nation a nation facing new and greater challenges in every facet of its economic life Never say we haven't a busy year ahead, Les. Well, all you fellas between you may have finished the war in Europe, but it's a cinch. None of you returning to the telephone company are going to have much of a chance to relax. Who wants to? Just let me get out of this and back to my old job. Your old job? Oh, well, about that, Paul, I... I'm not so sure. You're not? Well, you see, Paul, it's... it's like this. Tony, haven't you finished with that yet? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Barker. All finished, all finished. You see, Paul, with Harry Kale's retirement, I'm moving up. So in figuring the right man to take over my job here... Well, what do you know? <laughs> Good luck with it, Paul. Oh, watch it, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> the nation out of war and into the fabulous 20s. A time of important progress everywhere in American life. As the nation grew, the telephone system kept moving ahead, erecting new buildings making new cable and line installations, anticipating the expansion of towns and cities and rural communities. By 1927, scientists at the Bell Telephone Laboratories were demonstrating a new development in communications, a device called television. I can see it. 
and I still don't believe it. And that's why we like you men from the operating companies to get in here once in a while. Gives you a first-hand look at some of the things we're doing. It certainly does, and I'm floored. I'll leave you to Dr. Stevens now. I've got work to do. So long. So long. <laughs> Doctor, is this practical for general use? Well, that remains to be seen. So far, it's still in the experimental stage. Can it be used to send out entertainment, sports, news events, things like that? Well, that could very well be in time, but it's like the talking motion picture device we've developed that I showed you this morning. It's valuable and it's important, but it's still a byproduct of our real work. And I don't have to tell you what that is. <laughs> Improve the system. Exactly. Better telephone service for more people every year. And still some byproduct, I'd say. To us here, better service means constant research in many fields. And sometimes what looks impractical now may be a vital part of the telephone system later on. Back in 1915, 12 years ago, a single word was heard across the ocean. Just one word clearly heard. Yet this year, regular transatlantic telephone service was established and you can talk across the ocean to London from any one of 18 million telephones in this country. 18 million. You know, Doctor, a great friend of mine once predicted 10 million telephones during my lifetime. And when old Mike said it, even that sounded fantastic. Mike? My first telephone boss, Mike Cassidy. Mm -hmm. Mike wrote me a while ago that he was retiring. Oh, not that there still isn't those Cassidy in the system carrying on for him. Oh? His daughter. Mike said she's just starting out as an operator in a small town out west, a place called Cedar Junction. I've often wondered what Helen Cassidy looks like. <laughs> if she's anything like her old man, she'll probably scare off every young fellow within a thousand miles. <laughs> Still there? Well, put him on, will you? Say, Catherine, finally found Bill. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, just in time, kiddo. Perry's going to take me to a dance over to Carlsville tonight. The board's all clear, and no LDs, and no... Say, this is your first time alone on the night shift, isn't it? Uh-huh. Scared, youngster? Oh, no. Maybe I am a little. Here you are. My first time alone, I'm a sit to be tied. Uh, nothing ever happens. Oh, that coffee. Keep it hot. Drink it if you get sleepy. I'll give you a ring when I get home. Just to see how you're doing. You know, there's one call you'd be sure to get. Oh, Mr. Kleiner. He calls every single night of the year, exactly at 11.55. Find out what time it is. <laughs> Got eight clocks in his house. Sets them all every night. Don't ask me why, he just does. <laughs> well, so long. Yes, Mr. Kleiner. It's exactly 11.55. Just wanted to be sure. Hey, you're a new operator, ain't you? Yes, sir. Well, what do you know? What's your name? Helen. Helen Cassidy, sir. Helen. Well, well. Good night, Helen. 11.55, eh? Well, it's 11.56 now. <laughs> so it is. Good night. Good night, sir. Number, please. Operator, a doctor, please send a doctor. Who is this? Tommy Payton. My folks are away, and Linda's arm is bleeding. It's bleeding awful bad. I can't make it stop. I'm ringing the doctor. Linda. Tommy, the person who's bleeding. It's Linda, my sister. She was carrying the lamp, but a broken cut her arm. How is it bleeding? Steady or in spurt? It jumps like this. Tommy, Tommy, listen to me. Is your sister right there? Yeah, just beside me. Well, well, let go of the receiver and feel up inside her arm, up above the elbow, and press with your thumb. Keep pressing different places until you find the one that stops the bleeding. And hurry, Tommy. Press hard. I will. Reedsville. Reedsville, this is Cedar Junction. I can't raise the doctor here in town, and there's an emergency on Valley Road between here and there. I'll 
calling Dr. Sloan. That's bad thinking, honey. Who's hurt? It's a little girl. She's... Hello? I got it. I stop. I got it. Stop. Good. Now, listen, Tommy. Have you got a handkerchief? Yeah, I got one. Well, tell your sister to hold her own arm a minute. And you tie the ends of the handkerchief together and slip it over her arm. And then with a pencil or, or a stick, twist it until the cloth is tight. And put the turning part right where you were holding. You got it? Okay. Be right back. Reedsville. The doctor's on the line. Hello. Hello, this is Dr. Sloan. I heard what you told the boy, miss, and that's exactly right. Where is this patient? At the Peyton Farm on Valley Road. Well, you tell the boy I'll be there in 10 minutes. I'm on my way. Yes, sir. This is Del Reedsville. Anything else you need? Well, I don't think so. And thanks, Reedsville. Hello, ma'am. I did it. It stopped and she can hold it herself. Fine, Tommy. And the doctor's on his way. He'll be there in 10 minutes. And if he isn't, you call me back. I will. Gee, thanks, ma'am. For a minute, I, I was almost scared. Well, I was almost scared myself, Tommy. For a minute. Are you okay now? Uh-huh. Bye, ma'am. Bye, Tommy. The fabulous 20s moved on. It was the golden age that was sure to last forever. And then, October 29th, 1929. And the end of an era, the beginning of a long ordeal. An ordeal that was to test the strength and ability of the nation to overcome the economic depression that engulfed it. Again, it began the task of rebuilding. By the mid-30s, the nation's industry in every field was on the move again. And once more, the telephone system kept pace with America's progress and helped it grow. The years brought changes, too, to Helen Cassidy, now Helen Larson, married, widowed, and mother of a 10-year-old son. Long since moved from Cedar Junction to a larger city, Helen has learned that the spectacular calls are rare in an operator's experience, but that friendly, courteous service is the normal day-by-day -day routine. That was fine. Oh, hello, Helen. You girls have met Mrs. Larson, our assistant chief operator. Indeed we have. How are the girls getting along with the collector's board, Bruce? Oh, fine. They're really doing beautifully. The dial still seems a little strange, though, after two years on a manual board in the other office. You'll soon get used to it. And you're in good hands to learn. Mrs. Larson, why all the bother to change to the dial system anyway? Wouldn't it have been simpler to keep all manual exchanges? It certainly would. But the way the codes are increasing without the dial system, there soon wouldn't be enough operators in America to take care of them all. Even as it is, we need more girls than ever before. Oh, excuse me. I've got a heavy date waiting. Goodbye, girls. Bye. 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 Heavy date? Hmm. Well, that's all for today, girls. Tomorrow yeah. we'll study our court practice. <laughs> Mom left the purse. Kimmy, I mean, I'll get it. You shouldn't be in here. <laughs> Never before had the American economy faced a greater challenge than in the days that followed. New military camps to be established, troops to be trained, factories to be converted and operated on a full wartime basis, and all the time, production, production, and still more production. It too was a challenge to the nation's telephone system. Switchboards everywhere were ablaze with signal lights. Western Electric plants working day and night to meet manufacturing schedules. Bell Telephone Laboratories developing new equipment and training technicians for all the services. Unbelievable, but somehow the job did get done, thanks to thousands and thousands of Paul Kendall's and Helen Cassidy's working day and night in research, manufacture, construction, and operation. And on the far-flung fronts of the global war, the equipment produced in Western Electric plants was doing its part to aid the millions of men and women in uniform. Radar, sonar, gun directors and rangefinders, 
field switchboards and all the rest were helping to bring closer that long-awaited day. Again, America was facing challenges in its economic life. All over the nation, men and women in the telephone companies were doing their part in a friendly, helpful way to maintain the highest possible standards of performance in a service that kept growing with even greater speed than ever before. Fifty years. So long, and yet so short a time. You might include some of these figures in your speech, Paul. Take just one of the outstanding growth periods, 1945 to 1950, for example. 43 million telephones in 1950, an increase of 15 million or more than 50% since 1945. Almost 100% since 1940. No, Harry. Figures aren't the answer. Oh, they're impressive, sure. Even impress me. Like the number of people who actually own the telephone system. Somewhere around a million stockholders, all over America. Mighty important, that. So are the new developments. Things like people dialing their own long-distance calls. And the calls themselves, carried hundreds at a time by radio or by a coaxial cable. It's all mighty impressive, Harry. But not for a farewell speech. For that, a fellow needs I still don't know. Thanks anyway for this, Harry. I'll just have to... Yes? Mr. Larson is here, Mr. Kendall. Oh, send him in. <laughs> know who this is, Harry? The grandson of my first boss. Just out of college and gone to work as a telephone research man. His mother is a chief operator in one of the companies. They both have come on to be there tonight. You've met the boy before? Never have. I'll see you later, Paul. Right. Mr. Kendall? Now come in, boy, come in. Just stand there a minute. Let me look at you. So you think you can be a telephone man, do you? I hope so, Mr. Kendall. They seem to think there's a chance at Bell Labs. That's quite a place, sir. No doubt in your mind about the future of the telephone, is there? Oh, none in the world. Why do you ask? Oh, I just remembered something, that's all. No matter. How's your mother? Fine, thank you. She's arriving by plane this afternoon. She said that Mike never would have forgiven us if we weren't both here for your retirement dinner. Well, believe me, boy, I'm glad you are here. Me too. Very glad. <laughs> yes, sir. You're Mike's grandson, all right. And I'm sure Paul knows, beyond any words of mine, how much all of us will miss him and how much real affection follows him as he retires from the system. Now, Paul. I... I have a confession to make. I've been trying to figure out for days just how to say goodbye. I still don't know. What can a fella say after 50 years? I do know I'm proud all of you are here. I'm proud too that the daughter and grandson of Mike Cassidy, one of the best friends I ever had, are both here. Ellen Larson and her son, Jim. Ellen doesn't know it, but I've sort of checked up on her through the years. 
And she's got as fine a record as any chief operator in the system. Of course, I don't have to tell any of you about the importance of women to the telephone business. Outnumber us men two to one. And old as I am, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> and Jim, well, he's about as new a telephone man as you could find anywhere. Just out of college a couple of weeks. So, of course, he knows more about the telephone than any of them. <laughs> but he's lucky, Jim is. He's joining one of the biggest teams in the world. At a time when, however astonishing, its achievements of the past may be, there's still only a promise of the things to come. Someone once told me that when I was even newer to the system than Jim is now. Keep your eye on that bell, Paul, he said. Take your life on us, son. As this nation grows, the telephone will grow along with it and play a wondrous part in that growth. And the future that lies ahead is beyond the belief of any man. And now, as I say goodbye to all of you I've known and worked with for many years, I say hello to the Jim Larsons and the Mary Angelos and the Harriet Flynns and all the young people, whatever their jobs, who are coming on. To tell the truth, I wish I had another 50 years to stay around and see what they accomplish. You see, now that the telephone is 75 years old, I've got the same hunch old Mike had when it was only 25. What lies ahead is beyond the belief of any man. For as great a part as the telephone has played in all our lives till now, Believe me, it's still only the beginning.